Scientific Coral was my coral research facility located in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. All corals in this video were asexually propagated in the facility and most are several generations removed from the wild. Although we grew many types of SPS, LPS, Gorgonians, and even Bergia, this video will only discuss one of our methods for asexual soft coral propagation. Let's talk about our method for propagating very large numbers of soft corals. The basic component of our method is called the tunnel cube. The tunnel cube is made out of a fast setting, cement based material and measures about 1.3 centimeters on both sides. And it's not really red of course, but I colored it red for the purposes of tracking it in this video. The cube has a vertical central tunnel going through it and was one of our most important discoveries in regards to soft coral attachment. Anyone who has tried to propagate soft corals knows it's like getting jello to attach to a rock. In each cube, a coral cutting is inserted into the tunnel and then attaches to the inner sides of the cube tunnel and grows into a small soft coral. The cube itself is organized in a matrix called a tunnel cube plate or TCP made of polystyrene egg crate commonly used in lighting materials. We cut our plates into 11 by 11 cube plates yielding 117 cubes. You can see all the way through the cube but note there is no netting on the bottom to hold the cuttings in yet. So step one of the process is to build the bottom of the tunnel cube plate assembly by adding a screen under the plate and then another egg crate that matches the tunnel cube plate exactly but is empty. Now when we zoom in a little you can see the same red cube in cross section. The bottom screen is made of common fiberglass screening like you see in a window screen. The purpose of the screening is to retain the coral cutting while allowing water and oxygen to pass through from the top and bottom and very importantly not creating any dead zones that could cause tissue necrosis leading to coral cutting death. The purpose of the lower egg crate is to isolate each individual cell so the coral cuttings can't move to a different cell while also allowing free flow of water and oxygen from below. Once you have these three components in place, attach rubber bands along each side to temporarily hold them in place. Step two is filling each hole in the tunnel cube plate using a turkey baster. It's a very fast, efficient way to fill in the holes. Filling in a tray of 117 tunnel cubes takes about a minute. Step three is to cover the tunnel cube plate assembly first with a netting and then another empty egg crate. It's important to align the top egg crate with the other two to allow maximum lighting, water flow, and oxygen from above and below and keep the cuttings from moving to other cubes. The top netting is different being made of a flexible soft polyester or nylon netting with a hole size smaller than the coral cuttings but much larger than the fiberglass screening. Its only purpose is to keep the coral cuttings in the tunnel. Once this is complete you should rubber band every cube on all four sides along the lines of the egg crates. So using about 20 rubber bands will provide a band on all four sides of every cube. It sounds like a lot of work but actually you can do it very quickly. When we first tried this tunnel cube method we expected the corals to attach to the bottom netting only. What we found was they would attach to both the bottom and the side or just the side of the tunnel. If you allow the soft coral cuttings enough time to attach, then later when you remove the bottom netting, they will remain firmly attached to the tunnel cube. 
This is an exploded view of the tunnel cube plate assembly that we just made. Step four is placing the tunnel cube plate assembly into your system and allowing time for the coral cuttings to attach. Here is one of our systems with many tunnel cube plates waiting for attachment. In the bottom left you can see a plate that has had the top netting and egg crate removed and the corals just starting to grow out one per cube. You can see how this is a very efficient use of space. Here you can see about 25 tunnel cube plates, each holding 117 corals for a total of about 2,925 starter corals in this image alone. It's important to put the tunnel cube plates in a low current environment, allowing the cuttings to settle to the bottom of the tunnels and not be disturbed, but to receive light, water, and oxygen as they attach. It's also essential to put the tunnel cube plates in a detritus-free system. Detritus will quickly clog the bottom netting, resulting in a high mortality rate. We use very shallow tanks, about 30 centimeters or less in depth, with bare bottoms. An external tank directly below it contains live rock, skimmers, reactors, and filters to maintain the water quality and suspend the plates on a framework above the bottom so when you move one it doesn't stir up detritus. Probably it's best to use artificial salt water or heavily filtered natural seawater in a closed system to avoid problems with detritus. Step 5 is removing the top egg crate and top netting and it should look something like this. Leave the bottom netting and egg crate on until attachment is well established. There is no need to remove the bottom netting and plate prematurely as the corals can start their grow out period with them still attached. Here is a good example of cubes you can still see circled in red that have been removed from the tunnel cube plate and inserted into artificial rocks. We use a non-toxic proprietary cement based mixture that seems to be safe for all corals and sets up quickly. You can clearly see the outline of the original cubes here and how they have been inserted into the rocks. And here is a batch that has grown out more. Once the artificial rocks are in your system for a while, they become indiscernible from wild caught rocks. This is the same type of rock you saw in the previous slide. It is a key system comprised of a top rock and an attached solid cube or key underneath it. The key fits into the egg crate plate and is used for organization or shipping of the corals on the plate. It's a very effective method for managing the corals. It's all poured together as one unit. And here is a picture of an actual rock with a key. This is the table that was taken from our earlier logbook describing the time it took for the soft coral cuttings to attach, the attachment rate for first attempts, and the survival rate of the coral cuttings. By making small changes, we were able to improve even on these rates of attachment. We were able to get a 100% survival and attachment rate on a large number of coral species. Here, these green zoanthids are another example of cubes that have just been inserted into the artificial rocks. And in the next slide, you can see how they are growing out. Zoanthus societatus, like a lot of soft corals, grow like weeds under the right conditions. Here are other examples of corals that we successfully grew using the tunnel cube method. You can see they are very competitive for light and space, taking up virtually all of the available space as they grow. Doing each plate as a monoculture is helpful because you don't get the competition between different species. So there's no chemical burning of neighbors or growth stunting. So for the best rate of grow out, it's best to stay monoculture within the plate. These actinodiscus are growing in tunnel cubes, but the way we obtained their base cuttings is covered in a different video. If you look closely, you can see the fiberglass netting at the bottom of these tunnel cubes. We have a highly efficient way of growing actinodiscus and discosomas that can produce nearly unlimited numbers of these corals, and that's covered in the other video. 
If you leave the netting and bottom empty egg crate on for a long time, you will get the soft coral filling up the tunnel completely and possibly attaching to the bottom netting. But it's easy to peel the netting off of most corals, although in some cases you may need to use a scalpel to separate the netting from the base. Again, all of these corals are multi-generational grow-outs far removed from the wild. We found that when trimming sarcophytons that you should just remove the capitulum, like a spare tire, leaving the capitulum over the stalk in place. They seem to recover and grow out faster than if you just remove the entire capitulum. All of the heterozenias do very well. This is a rock with a female cube that will receive the tunnel cube. These Fiji leathers are in the rock you just saw and looked very natural. They started out in tunnel cubes. These are combo rocks with three keyholes. You can mix and match in ways you don't see in nature. You can arrange them aesthetically, but you need to make sure they are compatible, of course. I usually choose two corals that encrust the rock and one coral that grows up above it. Most soft corals seem to be compatible with all of the others as long as they aren't constantly touching. Note the colors of the egg crate, in this case blue. You can coat the egg crate with Plastidip, which is a rubberized paint compound, and it helps to lock in the cube when you reinsert the cube or cube rock back into the egg crate. It holds the cubes in extremely well for storage and shipping, and it's available at most hardware stores. This quad fluorescent green leather was divided as it grew from one cutting. We've also divided one of these into eight stalks. These are not commonly found in nature. So why are we doing this? The biodiversity of our Earth's coral reefs, which took millions of years to build, may be destroyed in the next few decades unless we take serious and swift action to protect the coral reefs now. Many stony corals are being successfully farmed now, but soft corals are much more difficult to reproduce since they have no stony skeleton to attach to a substrate. We have developed several methods for high volume propagation of octocorallians and corallomorpharian soft corals. At this critical time for coral reefs, we hope this information can be used to preserve the coral reefs around the world. Remember, all of the soft corals that you saw in this video were asexually propagated using the tunnel cube method. Here we are making a rock mold. We are coating hand carved master rocks with latex to make a mold. The rocks were hand carved from poured cement based plugs of a non toxic proprietary mixture. Once it dries, you can then pour the rocks and then pop them out and use the mold over and over again for many more rocks. You might need a release agent such as talcum powder inside of each hole before you pour it. Here's an example of a glass plate that we use to grow actinodiscus soft corals. And here's an example of a plate where we grew Acropora nana, a stony SPS. Both of these techniques are covered in other videos. I'm really excited about this discovery. Even though it's fairly simple to execute, it took a lot of trial and error to actually figure out. I did this research over a 20 year period and the tunnel cube discovery didn't come until year 18. Most importantly, the tunnel cube method works. It is tremendously productive both in coral cutting survival and in attachment rate. We had a substantial decrease in coral cutting mortality and a substantial increase in coral cutting attachment rate. There are many potential applications for this. One application might be to use this technology to move and replant a coral reef. For example, before a dredging operation or after sea level rise or after a typhoon. We could geotag and collect samples of all of the coral species of an existing reef, either healthy or already damaged. And then set up a temporary facility to produce large quantities of these corals. 
We could then replant them either in the same area or a different area. Installing the new corals on a reef substrate would be simple. We can use an underwater portable drill with a bit size matching the diagonal of the cube to bore into the existing limestone substrate. And then we could pop the cube into the hole with no epoxy or anything. It would be held in place by friction only initially and then by the coral itself as it grows out. We could grow a new reef anywhere that the ambient conditions are right and that has a substrate, either natural or man-made. We learned in our research that it's definitely best to replant corals when they are young. So tell me how I can work with your organization to save the coral reefs.